Okay, so um, I'm Kai, and this is going to be a talk about modern TV werewolves. Uh, we are going to be looking specifically about male werewolves, specifically about male werewolves in modern TV programs, and specifically looking about the ways they are presented in relation to kind of gender and sexuality presentation, masculinity and queerness. Um, so this might start out a bit basic, but just to get a kind of very initial grounding, um, just for a bit of a bit, a bit of a definition, what are modern TV show werewolves? So for modern TV purposes, people who change into wolves and or wolf-like monstrous forms, usually influenced in some way by the full moon. Uh, there's been a bit of a boom lately in stories over the last few years or so, uh, the last couple of decades, that centre or include the perspective of werewolf characters. Uh, they often include humour, romance and empathy, both exhibited by and felt for the werewolf characters. Uh, weirdly, also higher education establishments. In uh, much earlier Gothic texts, so in kind of like 18th, 19th century novels, there was a tendency to write about closed institutions. So things like uh, big isolated manor houses or monasteries or nunneries uh, or asylums as places in which the uncanny could take place and places, places of which like the supernatural or scary or intense or dramatic events could take place kind of separate from the rest of the world. Uh, the modern version of this tends to be higher education. Uh, a lot of modern supernatural shows tend to focus on high schools and or universities for a very similar reason. It's a kind of almost closed community. It's, it's a group of people who are in the same place for similar reasons, but it's also a slight, <clears throat> excuse me, it's also a slightly liminal place. So there's a lot of a lot of opportunity there for kind of uncanny or supernatural things to happen. Um, there are a lot of common tropes. Uh, law details tend to vary between shows, uh, including variation on how lycanthropy is contracted, when transformations take place, how voluntary they are, how much control the human or human side has over the transformed behavior. Uh, so whether or not they get to decide what they're doing when they're in a kind of wolf form and whether partial transformations are possible or can be safely achieved. So I'm kind of laying this out to kind of demonstrate that when I say a werewolf, I'm not necessarily talking about exactly one thing. The way they tend to show up in media in the present and recent day can often have overlap and commonalities, but also have differences. So it's it can make it quite interesting to kind of compare the way that they kind of line up with each other. The werewolf human vampire sandwich. Um, so werewolf characters in modern TV shows are frequently presented, and often films, are frequently presented alongside human characters and also presented more often than not alongside vampires of some kind. And there tends to be a relatively predictable scale or spectrum in which these characters on average line up. Werewolves tend to be shown as more racialized, more often than not. They tend to be shown as black or as brown or as indigenous or as some kind of person of color or some kind of person who is from some kind of racialized background, essentially that is less white compared to usually the human characters who are almost always white and compared to vampires who are usually hyper white vampires are usually much paler uh vampires are also usually presented as older as more for lack of a better term civilized as very kind of gentrified almost there's a sense that Vampires are old, white, wealthy creatures. Humans tend to land somewhere in the middle of being, like I said, more often not white, but also more middle class. Um, and the human character tends to be framed or positioned a lot of the time as whatever is thought that the audience will most identify with. 
whereas the werewolves tend to be also scruffier, uh, more spiritual, more emotional, more connected to nature or natural spaces, uh, often shown as kind of less refined, sometimes less dignified, sometimes less in control of themselves in some way. Obviously, this ties into classism and racism in various ways, uh, sometimes also ableism, and sometimes in some ways also to queerphobia. But it can be an interesting juxtaposition to at least be aware of. Uh, it's not necessarily always used in a bad way, but sometimes it's, it's at least a thing to be aware of. Um, so the examples that I've got in the bottom here are Jacob from Twilight, uh, Luke Garraway from Shadowhunters, and Peter Romancet from Hellnock Grove. And then I've not included the human characters because they're all fairly similar to each other in these examples. Uh, but then I've got Edward Cullen from Twilight, Camille Belcourt from Shadowhunters, and Roman Godfrey from Hemlock Grove. A thing that I find interesting is that in Shadowhunters, not all of the vampires are white, but resultantly one of the main wealth characters is black. So there's still a sense that he is essentially darker skinned than the vampires around him. And that seems to be a fairly consistent way in which different supernatural characters tend to be kind of lined up with specific tropes or identities or, or positioned. Um, the beast within. So I'm going to make a brief mention of the fact and at least acknowledge that wolves and werewolves occupy a kind of problematic cultural position in relation to masculinity in some places. Uh, you get, you know, the dodgy men with, with wolf on their bio, or I'm an alpha male, or men who kind of identify with not usually biologically accurate or psychologically accurate and not usually very healthy notions around what they think wolves or werewolves are supposed to represent. Um, but conversely, I would argue that actually a lot of representations of werewolves often tend to kind of problematize or to explore or add nuance to concepts around masculinity or to compromise masculinity even in some ways. We could even say in some ways queering it sometimes. Um, so dealing with a werewolf involves generally splitting the character into at least two parts. There's the more human side and the more animal. Uh, and metaphorically, and sometimes literally speaking in some ways, that separates off the more aggressive or the more desirous or the more uncouth part of that person. But in order to do that, that means acknowledging the aggression and the desire and the uncouthness, uh, the lack of, and I use this term slightly critically, but the lack of civilizedness uh, within the person and having to deal with its existence or with the threat of its presence. So werewolf narratives often deal with the threat of or the consequences for this part of the self. Uh, they can involve um, the inner animal's empowerment, but they can also involve the inner animal's vulnerability. They can bring into mind fear of being found naked or of getting lost or of losing memory or of legal consequences. Um, I, I would refer to it as lycanthropy as an intense forced self-reflection. Um, the character or characters who are who are a werewolf or who become a werewolf are forced to reflect on the ways in which they may pose a danger to themselves or those around them. And in many situations have to kind of take steps in order to manage and to process that danger. So it's a lot more self-reflexivity. It's a lot more kind of processing of different parts of the self than a lot of male characters that are usually allowed to not get away with. Um, in the TV show The Order, lycanthropy is mostly shown as a kind of superpower, almost. It's shown as quite empowering, but it's also a multi-layered social bond. Um, they also use the phrase at one point, a non-gender denominational organization. Um, the Order does a lot of different things around gender, but one of the things that it does essentially is it, it the, the concept of being a wealth in the order is very tied in with the concept of responsibility to the people around you and 
very tied in with the concept of responsibility and communication. Uh, monsters and ambiguous queerness. Oh, another thing I was going to say is one of the reasons that I find TV shows particularly interesting is because with a film, a lot of the time the focus is on the person becomes a werewolf, uh, drama ensues, and then the story will often resolve with the person being killed or with the person kind of coming to terms that they're a werewolf and kind of running away into the distance. And it was very easy and often necessary to make it a fairly simple, well, important, but simple representation. Whereas if you have a TV show, you can't just have the character accept that they're a werewolf and then that's it. You need to fill the different episodes with different stories. So there's often a lot more space and a lot more requirement to think about how the character will manage uh, or will interact with being a werewolf in their more day-to-day -day life, how being a werewolf actually affects them more long-term, uh, which is why I like TV shows so much about it. So, Monsters and Ambiguous Queerness. Um, we're going to talk briefly about the Hayes Code. In 1930, more importantly enforced towards 1934, the Motion Picture Production Code, also referred to as the Hayes Code, was a set of rules governing American filmmaking. Um, it was an attempt to control the kind of media that was being produced to make it more palatable to a more conservative, more right wing, more heteronormative uh, kind of perspective. It included restrictions on sex, on violence, on identity. Um, it it was very much about trying to kind of make everything what you might think of in terms of family friendly, essentially. B movies weren't quite as stifled because they weren't taken very seriously. They were already expected to be kind of very lowbrow pop culture, to be quite camp and to be quite violent as a genre. They generally kind of slipped under the radar and weren't really monitored quite as closely, which meant that you started to see less queer representation in a lot of media, but it turned into a situation also where queers were starting to get their identification and their representation from B-movies because that was the closest they could find to something that was camp or that was in some way kind of queer or queer. queered. Um, so I'm not saying that's how you get queer coded monsters, but I'm, I am kind of saying that's kind of how you ended up with a with a, a, a culture of uh, the intertwining of the gothic and of horror and of monstrosity kind of becoming a strong overlap with the queer community. Um, I, I, I include a meme because I like memes. <laughs> also, we're going to talk a little bit about queer baiting. Um, which I sometimes refer to as a kind of script writing gay chicken, giving characters dynamics that clearly obviously might be gay, relationships that feel like there's an implication that they might get gayer in time, you know, costuming, turns of phrase, meaningful eye contact, emotional beats to a relationship, things that make you think that it almost seems like you could believe the characters might be gay, might be dating or might be attracted to each other but there's always or nearly always plausible deniability. Uh, space is left. One of the ways that I have described it is with queer baiting, the way that I would refer to it or conclude that it was queer baiting is, is space left for homophobes to be comfortable? If a thing can be watched and a person can watch it and just decide that everyone is definitely straight because there's no evidence that they aren't and that everyone is definitely cisgender and everyone is definitely not queer because there's no evidence. That's when there's an argument to be had for whether we could describe this as queer baiting. But it also feels worth mentioning this in juxtaposition with the Hayes Code because it does come from an understandable background of script writers and directors and producers having limits to what they could get away with but the more we move into the future the more sense of responsibility and pressure there is to say actually no we have queer representation it's a growing field it's a growing thing we would like some actual gays now or some actual trans characters 
Um, okay, imagine elevator music. Time for a brief break. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Is everything making sense so far? Um, okay, so we're now going to talk about specific TV shows and specific content within them to have a little bit of a look at the exact things that I'm referring to or to look at some examples of those. Um, yeah, inside you are two werewolves, you are on one supernatural TV show. I quite, I find it quite interesting that inside you there are two wolves, kind of cliche, because it, it, it makes sense that people want to understand themselves and it kind of is interesting when that becomes a discussion of archetypes and yeah so quite often um quite often tv shows will have more than one werewolf character and it's always interesting to see the ways in which they are kind of compared to each other um but when there's one it's still interesting you know to see how they're compared to the rest of the characters content note for some references to homophobia some references to sexual violence and some of the story arcs discussed um the magicians and hemlock grove in particular are quite oh sorry the magicians and hemlock grove in particular are quite dark uh they do cover some quite grim or violent themes in places uh so i'm very much recommending all of the tv shows that we are going to talk about but i'm recommending them with the proviso that it can be worth taking a look at, at what the content warnings might be uh, beforehand. I'm I'm also perfectly happy to be emailed or contacted on Twitter and to be asked about it, and I'll try and content one as best I can. Um, so we're going to take a look at Oz from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, George and Tom from Being Human, Peter from Hemlock Grove, Josh from The Magicians, and Randall and Hamish from The Order. I'm doing these chronologically. I'm going through them from 1997 to 2020 which I think also gives a bit of a sense of a time scale of the way in which the way characters are represented has become a bit freer and become a bit more broadened out. These are all side characters and or ensemble casts. The more central a character, the more pressure on the show to make them central, to make them non-liminal, to cater to a potentially imagined straight cisgender conservative leaning audience. Uh, to make them a safe bet. So the queerer and the more liminal characters tend to occur on or nearer to the margins of the story or to be blended in with other characters and stories. Daniel Oz Osborne from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, 1997 to 2003. The way that Oz becomes a werewolf is very interesting. It's in an episode in which they play with the trope of the assumptions that are made about the kind of person who might be a werewolf. The actual way that he gets infected with lycanthropy is he's bitten by his nephew. Uh, it, it's in a domestic and unthreatening space. But yeah, you know, as, as a small child, it's not the kind of situation in which one would expect to have a massive, violent, life-changing event such as being bitten by a werewolf actually happened to them. It's the stereotype is you'd be expected to be chased down in a forest or something. Um, in that episode, there's an initial sense of mystery as to who the werewolf is. And a lot of the time there's a red herring where a character called Larry is suspected of being the werewolf. Larry is very toxically masculine in quite stereotypical ways. He's quite obnoxious. They basically go, this is the guy who is kind of the most obnoxious, the least, again, I, I would bring in the term civilized, really. So they conclude that he might be the werewolf. And when Xander, uh, when Xander approaches him, Xander is one of the other sister eight male characters, um, he, he, he confronts him in a locker room, which is, again, a very kind of hyper-masculinized environment. So I think the people writing the show very much knew what they were doing in the way they kind of set this up. And then Larry comes out as gay. It turns out that the reason that Larry is being quite so gung-ho is because he is trying to approximate what he thinks straight men are like so that no one will suspect that he is gay. Uh, 
it, it very much calls attention to this idea of maleness as almost a construction in some ways. Larry is attempting to construct a straight male identity. And his shameful secret, as it were, is, is gayness. It's not actually supernatural at all. Meanwhile, Oz is small, he is unassuming, he is calm, he's quiet. If we compare him to the other male characters of the show, uh, if we think about Xander and Angel and Spike, I'm going to assume most or all the people watching have seen Buffy, or at least are li familiar with the characters, but essentially the, the other three male characters in it who tend to show up, who are of the same age group in, in many senses, are a lot more macho. They're a lot more confrontational, a lot more confident. Um, they're taller. Um, it's, there is, there's a big sense of Oz as someone who doesn't actually physically conform to what masculinity is kind of expected to represent. Um, and his werewolfness becomes a kind of metaphor in many ways for the concept of suppressing the aspects of masculinity that he predominantly does not actually seem to exhibit. It becomes about uh, him trying to not be out of control or violent or aggressive or angry or dangerous. And eventually it actually becomes his, his undoing in terms of his participation with the social group and with his place in that community. He ends up leaving the show. Uh, he ends up not being a main character anymore because he is so worried about the idea of harming people that he cares about that he simply removes himself from, from that situation. Instead, he removes himself from those relationships. So as a kind of early example, Oz is in some ways a very, I, I'm not sure it's fair to say Oz is queered exactly, although I think there's an argument for that definitely. So much as to say Oz is unconventionally gendered maybe. Um, for all, as far as we know, he is a cisgender man, but, and as far as we know, he is straight, but the way in which his masculinity is presented, explored and present is very much kind of tied in with his human werewolf kind of, um, binary almost. He, he's a very binarized figure in how he presents as a human compared to how he presents when he is in his wolf form. Um, George Sands and Tom McNair appearing in Being Human. Being Human is a show which starts out as um, three characters who are a werewolf, a human, and sorry, a werewolf, a ghost, I should say, a human ghost, but a werewolf, a ghost and a vampire who are housemates. Um, and later on the cast changes, more characters introduced, but other characters are phased out. So the format is kept mostly the same as there being one of each of these, of these representations of a werewolf, a ghost and a vampire. Um, but George is there for the kind of the first half of the show, essentially, and then is gradually replaced almost by Tom, who is there for the second half. In the very beginning of the show, George is in a, what I would argue as an almost codependent relationship with his vampire housemate, Mitchell. Um, they are very there for each other. George is very anxious. Again, similar to Oz, he's very quiet. He's very unassuming. He doesn't want to be aggressive. He's not very confident. Um, when he transforms, he leaves his possessions in the care of Mitchell. Um, when he is done with his transformation, he comes back to Mitchell. Mitchell is initially kind of represents his safe home space. Later on, both Mitchell and George are given girlfriends by the plot. I have a strong suspicion that at least part of the reason for this is because it cements them as straight characters. And I think if they had gone through the show without having visibly straight relationships, I think it would have just looked increasingly as if they were in a relationship, in a primary relationship with each other. Um, and they continue for the duration of the show to be very intertwined, very loving towards each other, to clearly care about each other. It's a very tender relationship. Um, it's not. It's not the kind of relationship that is actually all that common 
um, in terms of straight cis male representation. And again, in terms of the way that George is represented as, as a masculine or as a male or as a gendered male figure, he's not, like I said, he's not confident, he's not aggressive, he doesn't kind of represent any of those things, except for the fact that in his lycanthropy, he has this side of him that he is forced to confront that is more aggressive, that is more dangerous, uh, that wh whatever he does will, will be there regardless. Um, once Tom becomes the main werewolf character of the show, Tom is also quite, Tom is, Tom is a bit more confident in some ways, maybe a little bit more aggressive, but Tom is also a very vulnerable character. Uh, that, that's Tom on the bottom right. There is an episode in which the main emotional conflict, the main conflict, or one of the main conflicts, is the bad guy, the antagonist, convinces Tom that the other characters have planned him a birthday party. They don't actually know it's his birthday, but the bad guy, such as he is, convinces Tom that they do and that there's a surprise party happening and he has to not say anything because that would ruin the surprise and he has to pretend that everything's normal and then there will be a surprise birthday party. Tom is an adult, you know, like he's young, but there's an entire plot line about whether or not Tom will get a birthday party. And when Tom finds out that actually there isn't one, he feels abandoned and betrayed and deeply upset and deeply hurt. And when the other characters find out that this has happened, the way that they fix it is they celebrate his birthday. They validate him as a loved, appreciated, and kind of solidly situated member of their small social community, of, of their kind of found family. And again, I think that's really interesting because it is frequently the case that the storylines of male characters are violent or romantic. It's usually like this guy has to go fight some people or this guy has a girl he's trying to get. And to have these kind of comparatively complex emotional relationships and these complex emotional entanglements um, with people who, who they're not fighting or fucking essentially, I think is, it, it's again, it's interesting that it is the werewolf characters who these plot lines fall upon, who are used as figures to explore these concepts. And then after 2013, it gets clearer. Um, again, there's a sense of, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about the internet here, but a thing that I wanna mention is that the more that fan communities find each other and reinforce each other and kind of spring up and grow on the internet and internet spaces. Uh, the more fan fiction that gets made, the more people kind of talk about TV shows on Twitter, um, the, the more the people kind of make memes on Facebook. It leads to an increased sense of presence and awareness and pressure of queers and gender non-conforming and polyamorous and transgender and gay and bisexual people existing and wanting media that is in some way representative of or about them or for them. And I think one of the kind of turning points actually was the more this, this reached the tipping point and then media has relatively recently started to reflect and represent this more. I've also seen an argument made that pre the previous generation who started to grow up writing fan fiction have recently started becoming old enough and established enough to get jobs in the actual media industries. Uh, we now have script writers and directors and producers who grew up writing and reading fan fiction. So they grew up with uh, seeing Spock and Kirk and thinking that would be cool if they were actually boyfriends. And now we have Discovery, um, Star Trek Discovery, where there's actual queer people on it. And I think this has definitely happened with kind of supernatural media as well. This is Peter Rumansek, uh, who appears in Hemlock Grove. Hemlock Grove, um, oh yeah, these two love each other. <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is on the left that is Roman and on the right that is Peter. Um, they're a good example of the uh, of the kind of scale that I mentioned previously in which Roman is a vampire and is very wealthy and is um, a lot more kind of he, he's restricted to a, initially to a very specific role set out by his family, whereas Peter is um, he's a he's from a Romani family from a Romani traveler family. Um, at the beginning of the show, he moves into a static caravan um, or to a static trailer, and there's actually a line of dialogue in which one of the one of the like townspeople that he meets mentions about. Um, being friends with this guy who's a cop and he kind of nopes out of the conversation so there's a a lot of his family and his friends are sub, are subsistence criminals they are people who have jobs that are not necessarily or are not at all legal because that's what they need to do to survive so there's a big kind of schism it's a very Romeo and Juliet story about the kind of culture and about the kind of different directions and backgrounds that these two come from um but yeah one of one of the kind of very consistently established thing in hemlock grove is how intense the relationship is between roman and peter uh their relationship follows the same narrative beats of the love story um Ostensibly, the first season is kind of about investigating murders. Like, ostensibly, the main plot line is people are being murdered, and Roman and Peter are trying to figure out who it is that's doing the murdering. Um, the two of them frequently break up and get back together, essentially. Their relationship is not explicitly sexual or explicitly romantic at least to start with um but also there's a lot of framing of the way that their plot line happens and of the way that the show is set up that kind of feels very knowing um there's an there's a scene in which they are both in a random field in the middle of the night because they are investigating this particular murder that has just happened but then they're, they're caught, they're found to be in this random field in the middle of the night that they're not supposed to be in. And there's a very strong implication that the adults around them don't like that. Because the implication is that why would two guys just be in this field at nighttime? And the implication, you know, they live in a small town and the implication is that it's for fucking or possibly a drug deal. Um, they, well, they become friends. They start spending time together. Uh, in spite of the family schism. And in, there's a confrontation between Rome, Roman and his mother. Um, she asked what Peter's business was when he was visiting Roman. And Roman says that they were studying together, but she keeps pressing and kind of pestering. And he kind of blows up and he's like, you win, mom. I've been waiting for the right time to tell you, but without all the fiery passion of your disapproval, we take turns playing Juliet. I hope the headboard didn't make too much noise. And her response is, I will not have that filth in my house, which is a very layered response because there is so much implication that she could be talking from a perspective of classism. She could be talking from an anti-traveler perspective. She could be um, simply, she could actually be being homophobic. There's a strong implication that she is homophobic and that she is genuinely disapproving of the idea of, of Roman having a boyfriend. And it probably means all of these. And the show kind of sets up a world in which it is made clear that there are reasons to not be outwardly visibly gay. It's made clear that we might see these two boys, these two young men who are very intensely attracted to each other actually not get together, not necessarily because they're straight, but because there's too much social pressure for them to just not to. Roman works out very early on that Peter is a werewolf. And again, in a kind of implication that the show wants you to think about subtext, the way that Roman engages with this is he passes Peter a note at school that literally just says, can I watch? Which again, sounds very sexualized to me. It's the kind of thing that you would say 
uh, in a in a sexual context. I think um, there are ways in which the transformations of Peter are set up that knowingly and consciously separate the idea of being a werewolf as being inherently outwardly violent. The first transformation that we see is this transformation that is the first one that Roman has seen. But to some extent invited to kind of see it through Roman's eyes. Something I find very significant is that Peter's mother is also there. I would argue that this transformation in some ways operates almost as a birth analogy. Um, Peter is kind of quiet and distracted at first and he's kind of itchy and restless and he takes off his jewelry and then he takes off his clothes. And then there's this violent bloody transformation in, in which he kind of very physically, um, very brutally turns into something else. And it, it, it feels a lot more like a birth. Um, I've also uh, someone at the in the in the previous iteration of this talk. There was a comment where someone pointed out that another another situation in which a person might be naked or vulnerable or exposed around a parent is also in a carer situation, um, which I thought was also interesting because there is a lot to be said for lycanthropy as a kind of disability discourse or a disability analogy as well as a as well as a queer one. Um, but yeah, there's also this, this scene very much demonstrates Peter's relationship with his mother. Uh, Roman's relationship with his mother is very tense, very fraught, very controlling. Peter's relationship with his mother is genuinely caring. He has a, a genuine, healthy, emotional connection with his mother that is based on the idea of her caring about his welfare and actually wanting what's best for him and him trusting and believing that. Um, yeah, there's a couple of notes of the same, the same kind of, kind of thought. Yeah, it also this scene renders Peter very vulnerable and very exposed. Um, partly just as as the act of changing, but also the fact that he invites Roman in to see this. This is an act of reaching out. This is an act of a fairly intense and personal connection. The second time, or the second kind of really meaningful transformation that takes place is also not externally about violence. It's a scam to raise money for his mother's legal funds. The next time Peter transforms, it's at his cousin Destiny's apartment, which she explicitly uses for queer sex work. She explicitly is a sex worker and she explicitly takes male and female customers. And this is shown as kind of fine. The show doesn't particularly seem interested in judging that or in dramatizing it or making her either a punchline or a victim. Peter's cousin Destiny just is a sex worker who has an apartment. And Peter brings some drug dealers to this apartment and convinces them that he has an excellent drug that will thoroughly fuck them up and that will give them a smooth come down with no kind of adverse effects. He then puts on sultry music, um, mixes some harmless powder and some water and drips some white goop onto their faces, like into their eyes. And then takes his top off. And initially the drug dealers are kind of a bit scared or a bit upset because they think that he's coming on to them. And they're like, dude, we don't, we don't roll like that. And then he transforms. And it's, it's a quite intimate scene, but in a very different way. It's a transactional intimacy. Um, he's taking his clothes off and showing something very personal to these people so that they will give him a lot of money. So it feels to me like a very clear sort of sex work analogy in that point. It's not, he's not mugging them. He's not threatening them. He's transforming to give them an intense experience that they want to pay for. So that's the first two transformations of pizza. The third one I want to talk about also involves Roman again. Um, so the second one didn't, to clarify, the first one did, the second one didn't, this one also does. 
within the law of the show, if a werewolf pushes transformation too many times, um, when it's not a full moon, they can get stuck. So Peter can choose to transform when it's not a full moon, but it's dangerous and it's difficult and it's not recommended. And if he does it too many times, he'll become something else. He'll become a, a kind of monstrous wolf-like creature that has lost its connection to its human side that isn't really capable of changing back or of acting in a, a, a kind of human way. This actually happens to Peter. And the reason that it happens is because is because of an externally violent reason. He has to protect his family from some bad guys. There's like a whole bunch of bad guys. They're armed and they're threatening Peter's loved ones. So Peter changes, even though it's not full moon, so that he can protect the people that he loves and keep them safe. But because throughout the show, he's already been changing a few times when he wasn't supposed to in this final act, it, it becomes a kind of sacrifice and he kind of gets stuck. But then Roman saves him. After the violence has concluded, Roman crouches down in a similar pose, in a similar position to the one that he first, the position he first got into the first time he saw Peter. He kind of crouches down to be closer to the kind of eye level. He grabs Peter's head, reaches into his mouth, and then pulls Peter's human body out of Peter's wolf body. It's a very visceral, very physical, very messy scene. And it pulls the entire story more directly into a kind of fairy tale allegory. It, it, it gives an additional layer of meaning, an additional layer of mythos to what is happening. It, it doesn't really make physical sense unless you kind of think about it in this kind of almost fairy tale fairy tale sense um he pulls peter kind of naked and damp and again there's an almost birth metaphor but it's it's very intimate it's very intense it's a situation in which the two of them interact in a in an intense intimate connected way that men do not usually operate on particularly not on screen um it, it's yeah, it's, Roman is only able to do this because him and Peter know and trust and love each other, essentially. Um, the transformation at this point is a transformation, the, the transformation back into human is something that Roman is explicitly providing or facilitating as an act of love, as an act of wanting Peter to still be in his life. Um, the... The relationship between them for a very long time kind of skirts this area of intimacy. And like I said, has kind of romantic beats, but they do have female partners. And the first time that there's a scene in which Roman accidentally encounters Peter, he sees Peter through a window with a woman and drives away into the night um, with rain beating down, yelling homophobic slurs at himself and berating himself and sobbing and shouts, Peter wouldn't cry over you. Uh, trying to convince himself that he shouldn't be this upset that he saw Peter with a girl because Peter would not be upset at the concept of the loss of him. And I thought that was really interesting as well. And my actual reaction to it was Peter would in fact cry for you. <laughs> um, I, I would argue, I would argue that, that Peter loves Roman just as much as Roman loves Peter. And then there was only one bed. Um, the, the show does at one point segue off into a romantic uh, triangle in which they both really care about and love the same girl and want the same girl and she really cares about and wants them and instead of being resolved through direct conflict with each other it's resolved through the girl sitting them both down in Roman's house and telling them both how much they both mean to her and then walking towards Roman's bedroom <laughs> 
and being like, are, are, you, are you coming with? And and it's and it's awkward and it gets complicated, but canonically there was only one bed. <laughs> um, canonically, they do get together in the show. Okay, so I want to also talk about Josh Hoberman. Um, he appears in The Magicians. Josh is also a werewolf. The way that Josh is a werewolf is one of those instances in which it is kind of treated more as an analogy, almost as a kind of STD metaphor in places. But one of the ways in which I find that interesting is that it's also used as a way to explore concepts around consent and responsibility and care. Um, the situations in which it becomes relevant that Josh has, it, the point at which Josh finds out that he has become a werewolf, and a later on point at which it becomes relevant that Josh finds out he might have accidentally infected someone else, these situations are treated explicitly as occurrences in which consent is, is a, as a meaningful factor or, or was absent. They are treated as situations in which there is an expectation, not necessarily fulfillment, but an expectation in which Josh is upset when he finds out that he was not given full disclosure by the person who infected him. When Josh finds out he might have accidentally infected someone else, there's a sense he genuinely is concerned about this person, not just because he might have unleashed another werewolf on the world, but because he did something to someone that they were not fully aware of. Josh in general is never canonically actually shown to be bisexual, but Josh is, the Mitch just does have canonically bisexual characters to clarify, which is great. Josh is never explicitly shown to be one, but Josh is shown as a extremely emotionally astute person, as an extremely caring person. Um, he is a drug dealer, but he also bakes, he caters, he cooks. Um, there's an episode in which someone has been lost so he makes bereavement muffins there's an episode in which the characters have to kind of stay awake for several days in a row for plot reasons so he makes muffins with speed in them um he he cooks as a way of kind of showing care for the people around them he listens as a way of showing care for the people around him there's a plot line in which one of the other characters has to save the world specifically them they're the only one that can do it and the reason that they are able to, one of the main tipping points is Josh takes them to a cafe and sits them down and listens to them talk about their problems. And that kind of empowers and centers this other character so that they're actually able to get on with the things that they need to do. Um, yeah, as I said, Josh tries very hard, I think, to be ethical. He's in a, later on in the show, he gets into a non-monogamous relationship with one of the most powerful characters in the show. Um, there's, a, there's a female character called Margot who is very powerful. She's very strong, sort of plot-wise speaking. Um, she's often a little bit sometimes ethically dodgy. She is one of those kind of means justify the ends people at some times. Uh, she is not always necessarily the most emotionally available or even the most emotionally articulate. And one of the things that happens when Josh and Marco get together is Josh kind of calls her on her shit. Josh expects a relationship in which they treat each other as equals and in which they are taken seriously. Earlier on before this, in fact, the way that Josh becomes a main character, he starts out as a kind of supporting character or as like a minor character. And there is literally an episode in which Josh expresses being upset, essentially at being treated like a like a supporting character. He expresses upset that he's texted the other the other more recurring, the main characters, and they haven't really got back to him. They they haven't engaged with him. And again, a bit like the episode with Tom previously in Being Human. In this episode, the there is a specific plot point that can actually only be resolved by emotional care. There is, there is specific acceptance, care and support that needs to be shown and that is shown, which resolves plot issues. And again, I find this very interesting because once again, it's an example of 
a male character for whom social and emotional interaction and social emotional competence is one of his primary methods of interpreting and contributing to the world. And this is very uncommon. It's very uncommon to find male characters for whom their kind of their masculinity, their gender presentation comes out as a thing that is sensitive and emotionally intelligent and kind of socially connected in healthy or supportive or up, or sort of uplifting ways. Um, right, the Knights of St. Christopher. Again, the order is a uh, as, a, as a modern supernatural TV show set in a period, set in an institute of higher education. Uh, it's set in a university. The main protagonist, Jack, joins this university, kind of enters the story because he is on some kind of revenge quest for his missing father. It, it feels very kind of hero's journey at the start. And again, this gets kind of subverted. He falls in with a group of werewolves called the Knights of Sir Christopher, um, who include specifically in this case, uh, Lilith, Hamish and Randall. Randall is body positive. Um, there's a scene in which Randall is trying to teach Jack to harness and to control his, his changing and trying to teach him how to kind of transform. And there's dialogue which says something like Jack says, why am I in a towel? And Randall says, because you're still learning and you don't want to ruin your clothes. And Jack says, why are you in a towel? And Randall says, because I'm body positive. <laughs> Randall is in a towel to support Jack. Randall is in a towel because Jack is in a towel and it kind of equalizes them. It makes Jack less vulnerable. It, it's a way of getting onto Jack's level um, to, to and, and in a way that he doesn't mind. There's also an episode in which Randall and Hamish kiss. Um, Randall is, I think, yeah, he's, he's referred to on TV tropes as ambiguously bi. I would argue that Randall counts as bi. Um, there's, there's a conversation in, in which he refers to a male and a female, a couple of characters as hot and hotter. Um, he he kind of expresses notions that he is in some he is in some cases sometimes attracted to male characters. Um, there's a conversation between Jack and Hamish, where Hamish mentions having previously dated another werewolf, and Jack says, "You and Lilith, or you and Randall," and Hamish says, "No," and he wishes. Um, Randall and Hamish ha at one point kiss each other to get out of an awkward situation. They are being they're being followed. They're being monitored by the bad guys. And of all of the kind of wacky schemes they could use to try and escape the situation, they make the the people watching them vaguely uncomfortable by flirting and then making out and then being like, "Let's get out of here and getting up and leaving." And of course, they're not followed because the implication is they're going off to bang. And then when they kind of get back to the house, um, Hamish is like, Randall and I had to kiss each other to get away from our monitors. And Randall's like, yeah, had to, had to, kind of sarcastically. And it's treated as a bit of a joke, but I did not feel when watching it, like as a bisexual person, I was the butt of the joke. I felt like I was included on it. Um, the show intermittently engages with concepts of consent. Uh, the show creates a universe in which consent is part of the fabric of the universe uh, as the thing that can be present or absent. And I feel this is important to mention because it feels like Hamish and Randall, again, trusted each other and knew each other well enough that it was explicitly okay that they kissed each other. Even though they are not actually in a relationship, they were able to smush their faces and that was okay. That didn't actually in any way whatsoever damage their relationship to each other. That didn't create any kind of awkwardness between them. It wasn't treated as a thing that was gross or weird. It's just the thing that they did. Um, Randall especially is very emotionally present. He is physically affectionate. He seeks um, physical consolation. 
there's a conversation at one point when uh, Jack is upset and then one of the other characters is like, I think we should give him some space. And Randall says something like, oh, I was thinking more like a group hug. Um, he finds a puppy at one point and completely melts over it. They they have um, they have cocktails in little pineapple glasses. Like the puppy thing and the pineapple cocktail thing is obviously not explicitly queer, but it's a little bit gender non-conforming. It's a little bit removed from completely straight faced notions of straightness. Um, Randall and Hamish's gender and their gender presentation and their kind of relationship with their own gender is a little bit softer, a little bit more flexible, a little bit more um, nuanced than heteronormative male characters tend to be. Um, we're going to imagine some more elevator music and we're going to have a little brief break. Uh, any comments or questions? Any thoughts? Is this all still making sense? Okay, so we're now going to look a little bit at tropes. Uh, we're going to move away from specific instances of me describing TV shows that exist or describing characters to looking a bit more about some of the general concepts that I think are interesting to explore that kind of crop up in these kind of shows um, and in the discussions around them. Um, so one, there are ways in which queerness and gender and sexuality and consent can be represented by characters behaviors and there's there's kind of views that characters can be shown as having and then there's ways that all of those concepts can be represented or explored by the show itself and these can overlap and they can interact but they're not always necessarily the same thing you can have a homophobic character in a show that in many ways is extremely uh, pro pro queer relationships, or you can have a a gay character in a show that is covered in kind of homophobic tropes. So one of the things that I find interesting about some of the shows and the characters that we've been talking about is they often feel that in varying ways, like the show itself is creating space for queerness. Um, <clears throat> So one of the ways that they do this is, for example, having another character ask or imply about queerness. Um, so uh, Miranda, one of the, the characters in Hemlock Grove, uh, she notices the tension between Peter and Roman and she says, did you two date the same girl or each other? And this isn't kind of treated, this is treated as slightly humorous, as slightly playful, but it's not really a punchline or a homophobic jab. The implication is she wouldn't judge or mind if they dated each other. She isn't accusing him of anything. She's literally asking because she's noticed the tension and she's wondering if that's part of it. The, the way the dialogue is written explicitly is setting up a world in which bisexual people exist or in which gay people exist. And whether or not there was ever a scene in which we find out that Roman and Peter got together, the fact that this line of dialogue is there is a way of demonstrating that that, that gayness is is a thing that could, in theory, happen. Um, see also Jack asking Hamish um, about Randall. Um, there's a scene in The Magicians in which Margot, who is bisexual, asks her friend Elliot, who is also bisexual, uh, just floating this, would it be weird if I fucked Josh? And Elliot says, I certainly hope it would be weird. It's been pointed out that actually one of the ways in which this is relevant is as much about sex positivity, which isn't always inherently queer, but you kind of need sex positivity within a cinematic universe in order for queerness to really fully exist. You kind of need a universe that accepts the notion of sexual nuance and of identity nuance in order to really fully have accepted and supported queer characters. And when Elliot says, I certainly hope it would be weird, it doesn't feel like he's saying, again, like he's saying that as an accusation. 
it doesn't feel mean spirited. It feels like he is saying he hopes that she would have an interesting and fulfilling encounter with Josh. Uh, he he wants his friend to have a happy and successful sex life. And again, the notion of friends kind of being interested in their other friends' sex lives is, is an intimacy. It's setting up a world in which the relationships of the characters allow space for the idea that these are people who have sex lives and who care about each other in a way that incorporates wanting that to be a healthy, consenting, uh, the successful thing that they're engaging in. Uh, yeah, also gender nonconformity. Werewolves are kind of almost inherently a bit gender nonconforming by the very fact that they change into something else. They go from being a human man or a woman to being not that. So there's already an aspect of liminality or of fluidity around this to some degree. Also, male werewolves, um, as, as has been kind of pointed out elsewhere, are men who are subject to hormonal changes that occur monthly, which is normally a thing that is usually associated as a more feminine thing. Again, trans people exist, not all people who have, not all people who have periods are men, not all women have periods, but generally speaking in kind of cultural awareness, incorporating this idea that there are men who are who are subject to specific hormonal changes on a monthly basis. It's, I've, I've seen it argued that, that werewolves are kind of inherently a trans metaphor, which I think there's a certain amount of weight to, and this is one of those reasons. There's also a sense of queer proximity. Um, a thing that I'll talk about a little bit slightly later if there's time is it's currently more palatable to have objectively canonically bisexual female characters than it is to have bisexual men. I can point to several female werewolves who are on screen canonically bisexual. I can't necessarily point to as many who are male werewolves, but often you do get male werewolves who exist in queer proximity. Um, Oz date in Buffy dates Willow, who later on identifies as, as a lesbian. She, she explicitly becomes really quite queer. Uh, Randall uh, is involved at one point with Lilith in The Order, who also is canonically on screen bisexual. Um, Josh is in an open relationship with Margot, who is bisexual, and who is also in a very kind of committed platonic-ish life partnership in many ways with Elliot, um, who is bisexual. <laughs> um, the Magicians has a very queer universe. Um, Roman, as much as he is a vampire, has a... He has a relationship in the small R sense. Uh, that he has a kind of West mentor figure uh, who works for his mom's company called Johan Price, who is gay and who at some point later on in the, in the show literally kind of comes out as gay and gets a boyfriend. And the fact that they're engaged with each other in some way, the fact that they interact positively. Um, there's a conversation at one point in which Johan implies that he would be okay with Roman being gay. He kind of gives Roman that space uh, in, in which it suggested that if Roman wanted to talk to Johan about that, Johan would be okay with it. Uh, Peter has a cousin called Destiny, who, like I said, is explicitly is explicitly bisexual. Um, these relationships are important because you can watch TV shows or films in which you can watch the entire thing and like the characters and maybe even identify with or feel attachments to the characters and still not know that if you met them, they would be okay with your queerness. Uh, there are characters who you can not know if they would be homophobic because you never see them engage with any concept even remotely implying the existence that, that gayness is a thing. That's to do with the way that these stories are written. That's to do with the fabric of the universe that the show or film is creating. So the fact that these narratives that we've been talking about and looking at are putting werewolf male characters, and it often frequently is specifically the werewolf male characters, into explicitly queer supportive roles or explicitly queer connected 
uh, queer engaging, queer embracing roles, sometimes literally. It's creating a universe in which within that context, it is okay for queerness to exist. And in which it is okay for gender non-conformingness, in which it is okay potentially for transness or potentially gayness or bisexuality or even asexuality to exist. Um, the two people in the bottom right picture are Hamish and Vera from The Order. Hamish and Vera have a complicated relationship that is explicitly defined as non-sexual. Um, there is a scene in which Vera tries to kiss Hamish and then she realizes he's not into it and she backs off. Uh, she recognizes there is lack of consent and she backs off, she gives him a bit of space. And she says something along the lines of kind of thinking at first that that was something that he wanted and then realizing that it isn't. But then they continue to support and engage with each other. Again, in a, in a complex way, it's, it's not necessarily my straightforward relationship, but their relationship is explicitly very emotionally interconnected. I, I would casually describe it as they vibe, they vibe with each other. Um, and shows which have these kind of strong interpersonal connections on various levels that aren't just limited to heteronormative friendships and heteronormative love stories. I think in turn, again, allow more space for kind of the possibility of queerness. I want to talk a bit about subverted Cartman triangles. So Cartman triangles, the Cartman triangle is a thing that exists in the real world as a concept uh, in kind of psychological conflict descriptions. It, it's, it's kind of a psychological, um, it's kind of a psychological concept. It, it's about conflicts in which people tend to fall into the roles of persecutor, rescuer and victim. People will kind of identify, line up with, act in ways which reinforce identities of being one of these roles. It tends to get used quite a lot in quite heteronormative, cliche, uh, really quite unhealthy ways uh, in a lot of heteronormative media. If you think about examples where a female character is uh, in some way physically or sexually threatened by a bad male character, and then the good male character steps in and rescues her. And this does all kinds of things within that narrative to reinforce the idea of the good, in inverted commas, male character as being good because he is in direct comparison to and is better than the man trying to do the assaulting. And it also kind of presents him as someone who is strong and brave and capable who can offer protection to the female character who is placed squarely in the position of victim and is needing protection. Uh, if we think about Twilight, there is a scene in which this happens and then Edward's response to having just rescued Bella is to express that he is upset by what just happened and to request that Bella essentially distract and console him. She's the one that was just threatened and was just in danger, but his emotional experience is presented as the most important part of it. His distress is waved as a flag to kind of try to imply how much more of a moral person he is, and she is delegated to a kind of supporting role. Cartman triangles in some stories are kind of rotated or subverted as a way of exploring gender and exploring conflict in a way that is a little bit queerer or is a little bit less predictively gendered and kind of sexualized in quite such a heteronormative way. Um, in the order, there is a plot in which Randall, is, Randall and his friends are in a bar and they see a girl who they don't know who is being pestered by some guy who they also don't know. And Randall goes over to kind of back her up, essentially. And it's made clear by the story that she does not need rescuing. This isn't actually about Randall asserting dominance for asserting kind of protectiveness. Um, he, he goes over and he kind of, and she decides to hang out with him. 
but initially on the surface it does look a little bit like a Cartman triangle because it does look like it's kind of playing with a concept of on some level at least he's kind of saving her or helping her because she was being like pestered by this guy but then it turns out that she is the bait and she helps to drug and kidnap Randall at which point he is trapped in a science facility and is forced to transform or to partially transform into his werewolf form and he is forced to fight other people against his consent. He is clearly traumatized by this, he is clearly distressed in this situation. It feels very metaphorical, it's a situation in which a male character is explicitly being removed of agency and it started with him in the rescuer position but actually he then ends up in uh in in the position of the person who needs to be rescued and his male friends come and rescue him uh they they, they come and they like they wrap him up and and help to remove him from the facility they they come and save him and this also happens um, throughout the show, there are situations in which the characters kind of help to save or protect each other. And again, this is one of the situations where if a, if a media is long form, it gives more opportunities for characters to exist in different roles, for power dynamics to be kind of shifted around. And one of the ways in which a narrative is can be queered or can be made less heteronormative or less gender normative often tends to be in which there is nuance given to which genders might need saving or which genders are capable of being traumatized. Uh, queer shows tend to engage with the concept that men are equally capable of becoming traumatized or of being subject to a victim position as it were. Um, and equally again it's it's a socially reinforcing scene. The fact that his friends come and they look after him and they, they save him, it, it reinforces the social bond between them, but it doesn't feel like it's setting up a hierarchy where they are in some way better or stronger. They just happen to be in a position where they're able to save him. So they came and did because they care about him. Um, similarly in Hemlock Grove, there is a scene in which Roman wants to save Peter from being kidnapped by a cult and initially can't and this actually traumatizes Roman. Roman is in the position of wanting to be the rescuer and feeling like he should have been able to do that. The literal literal line of dialogue, I should have been stronger for you. Um, Roman is deeply emotionally affected by the fact that he wasn't able to swoop in as a stereotypical rescuer and and, and butchly and masculinely be a, be a protector of, of, of Peter. Um, and again, this uh, over the course of the show, Peter and Roman sort of take it in turns to in some way harm or help or look after or save or affect each other. Uh, there's not a sense of hierarchy where either of them are more or less powerful. It's, it, it, they, they have a nuanced landscape of emotions and a nuanced landscape of kind of power relationships with each other. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to talk briefly about how the less heteronormative and the more kind of queered or queer a uh, TV show is, often the more you get these interactions where trauma and conflict and violence aren't enacted purely in a kind of hierarchical gendered way. They tend to be more nuanced and more complex. Um, and that brings us to kind of my final point, which is I want to acknowledge there are female werewolves um they absolutely exist including in the shows i've been talking about i would need to do an entire separate talk if i wanted to really discuss them completely um this is explicitly a talk about male werewolves and masculinity but i find it encouraging that the shows that i've been talking about also have some quite strong female representation they have female characters as i've said earlier who in many cases are actually explicitly bisexual um, who are embracing their monstrosity at times, who are presented as complex, nuanced people with varying personalities, varying gender representations. Um, and, and again, it's, it's nice that there are 
an increasing representation of different types of relationship and different types of gender representation uh, within this media. Um, I really like the fact that supernatural media and horror media is kind of so strongly embracing some of these concepts. I really like the fact that you can you can watch a thing about werewolves and it's not just you kind of identify with it because it's a monster and you like monsters. It's it's explicitly being used as a way of exploring of on the screen exploring uh, concepts around gender identity, sexuality, and queerness. Um, and yeah, in conclusion, um, I love just how many memes and fan fictions and how much of a sense of community there is around these media. I, I love that there are people writing and drawing and photo editing and putting up uh, YouTube music videos of, of footage sliced together with, with these characters. Um, it is very exciting and I'm really interested to see where the genre goes next. Thank you very much. That is, that is the end. <laughs>